Wow, it's good to see all of you guys. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Honestly, I kind of invited myself. You, you okay? You guys okay with that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I thought Mark Staczynski was kind of, I don't know who actually is. But anyway, I called up and said, hey, I want to see everybody. And so uh, can I come, please? You guys said yes. So thanks. Appreciate it. It's, it's all good. Uh, man, it is really good to be here, and uh, I'm so thankful. I see some really great, familiar faces, and and yeah, it's it's been a long time since I, we were here. We left here in 2001, right? No, is that right? 2001. So that's that's a few years. Uh, I think I said this the last time I was here, but I mean, I look back on our years of ministry here just as some of my very favorite. I, some of it has to do with our kids and the age they were and all the kids that were running around here. Do you, I mean, it was nuts. It really was. And uh, nuts in a good way. Um, it, mine or is this somebody else's? It's mine? Oh, mine. Thanks. Um, uh, we just, we just, uh, we look back on the years that we spent here as just being some great years. I mean, God gave us a really nice house just around the corner and, and, uh, just some great friends for our children and some, just, just some really great times. And, uh, not that we haven't had good times other places and, and God is doing some amazing things, but, uh, I just really hold a very dear spot in my heart for this church and the people of this church and, I look around and I see so many familiar faces, and then I also see some new ones, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I was sad to hear of the passing of your pastor. I got to meet him that one time when we were here, I guess it was a year ago or more. It was probably a little over a year ago, and uh, I, I liked him, and I think he did a great ministry here for a number of years, and so you guys are in a spot now, and uh, we'll be praying for you as you work all those those details out. That's never, um, it's always a hard time. It's a, it's a difficult thing to do. But uh, God is always faithful and will continue to be faithful through that process for you as you guys remain faithful. So just let me encourage you in that. So let me tell you a little bit, and we're going to go into much more detail uh, in, our, in the Sunday school hour, so I don't want to give it all away. But uh, we, are, we moved to Ithaca, New York. We did that uh, a little over three years ago now. And uh, when we did that, I had in mind what I thought ministry would be like, what uh, we thought we would be doing. And But I always held back a little bit and said, whatever God wants to do, we'll be grateful for that. We'll partake in that in whatever way he wants to do that. In my heart, we thought we were going to Ithaca and we were going to work with college kids. And, and we wanted to start a coffee shop. Uh, I've never started or run. I know how to make coffee. You put it into the top, and you put it in there. You push the button, water, and it comes out. So that's that's. This, but I love I love the atmosphere of a coffee shop, and we just thought that that's what God might do to for us. And uh, I still believe that that's probably going to happen at some point. Uh, but when we got there. Everybody kept saying, "You know what? You need to go talk to this guy. He's a this 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 crazy guy." got on fire for God, and he started a ministry called, well, actually, we didn't have a name, but he took guys that were homeless in downtown Ithaca. There's a lot of that going on in Ithaca. There probably is a lot of that going on around here. You just don't see it as much. But um, he's, he, he's got a burden to reach out to these people, to help them out through different circumstances. We'll talk about that later. And he took those guys out of the jungle. Now, the jungle is just a tent village in downtown Ithaca. And he moved them into campers on his property at his shop, a body shop, and then out by his house. And he put these guys in those homes, moved them up there, and and started working with them. And that just wasn't feasible. And that became Second Wind Cottages. And you can go on our website, secondwindcottages.org, or Facebook. By the way, you need to like us on Facebook. We're over 500 likes now, so at least 500 people like us. Um, and, uh, you know, check out our ministry. Check out what, what's going on there. And I would just say, and, you know, I, I, you know, I'd say this. I would just say that I've never been part of a ministry that I feel has been more effective. Now, I realize that you are part of that. You could take hurt to that, but don't. 
we had great ministry here. But I, I, I've, we've seen lives, I mean, 40-year drunks, alcoholics, that had a choice. I'll pay my rent or I'll buy beer. I'll buy beer. And they live in a tent. And they live in a tent in Ithaca, New York, um, where last, the last two winners, well, you guys are in New York. You, you know what the last two winners were like, um, were horrendous. People die. And uh, those people chose that. But we've seen guys make the choice uh, to come in out of the cold, come into one of our cottages, and start the process of a relationship with us, and then we're praying for a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we've seen people come to Christ. We've seen uh, a number of those guys come into a relationship with Christ, still fighting those fights. One of the guys that was in one of our cottages, one of a really good friend, uh, loves to cook, um, working at Dunkin' Donuts. And he, he went downtown, and they had a, they had a Christmas party. Holidays are tough for a lot of people. I mean, you can understand that they're really hard. And, you know, the people that he worked with, you know, they, they put those little bottles of booze in his pocket. And, and he came to one of the guys with us and that picked him up from work and he said, Oh, they, they gave me, they gave me booze in my pocket. They just, so here that, here it is. He gave him two of those bottles. He got three. So, you know, that starts the process. One year, one year of sobriety. And, but praise God, somebody saw him coming out of the mobile station with a brown bag, and somebody called us up, hey, we think, we think he's, there's some problems there. Go over to his house, to his cottage, look in his refrigerator, and, you know, God is there. He doesn't want to do that, but it's tough. It's tough. And, he gives God the glory for rescuing him early. A year ago, he drank so much that, I mean, literally, it would have killed you and I. We're talking bottles of vodka. Just, I don't know how he lived, but I guess he's grown a little bit immune to some of it anyway. But uh, so, great things. But it is a hard, hard, difficult work. But uh, I'll talk about that in Sunday school, so come on out. And we'd love to love to have you there. Uh, we are going to look at a passage, Luke 15, and uh, this is one of my favorite passages. I, I love, I love this passage. There are so much emotions tied up in this. You know, the, the, we're going to spend most of the time in the passage that we call the, the parable of the prodigal son, which I believe is just a little bit misnamed, but. Um, it really starts out with a passage that Mark read, Luke 15, and uh, Jesus is hanging out with people that he shouldn't be hanging out to, at least according to the, the scribes and the Pharisees, all the religious people, and they're upset at him for doing that. They begin to grumble. He's hanging out with these people because they had in their mind that these people were somehow infected or would affect you, and that when people were sinners that you stayed away from them. You didn't let them touch you. You didn't come near them. That somehow, you know, being with them and talking with them and hanging around them would make you the same way. And, you know, some of us have some of those same attitudes. I know we do. And so Jesus tells them uh, these three parables. The first parable being the, the parable of the lost sheep. Now, we're talking about, a, you know, a culture where sh the shepherding was the deal. Everybody did that. And uh, the whole idea, I mean, when he said, you know, if, how many of you had 99 sheep? Well, I've got to ask you, how many here have ever had 99 sheep or 100 sheep? You know, obviously, we don't, we don't relate as well to that. But the idea is he lost one of his sheep. Um, and he goes out and he looks for it. And this is a picture of God. This is a picture of God chasing us down, of coming out and looking for us. And uh, he says, when he's found it, he's going to he's lay his hands, he's going to put it over his shoulder. When he comes home, he'll call his friends together, and they're going to rejoice, and they'll be happy about this. And you've got to remember, who is he telling this parable to? Who is he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees, the scribes, the people, the religious people. And uh, he says, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents 
than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The question I always have when I read that is, is this, who needs no repentance? Is, is there anybody in this whole world that doesn't need to repent? The only person that was ever born in this world that didn't need to repent is the man speaking the words, Jesus himself. So every he's obviously, that's a tongue-in-cheek. He's he Obviously, he knows that they need to repent, because, and they need to repent of a lot. So then he goes on to the next parable. He talks about a woman, or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. i got to tell you, have you ever lost something that you really, I mean, is that the most annoying thing in all the world? You lose your wallet, you, you, you lose something, and you can't find it. You look everywhere. I remember one time when I was living here, um, I'm dr- driving down the road, and I somehow caught on the side of the road a wallet laying on the side of the road. I thought, oh, cool, a wallet. I hope there's no name or anything in it. Of, of, of course there was. So I pick up this wallet. And I look in, I see the address, and I drive over to the to the house, and there's this guy in the driveway, and he's laying, the door is open, and he's on his knees, and he's crawling underneath the seat of his car. You know what he's doing. He's like, where did I put that stupid thing? What? And I walk, hey, are you looking for this? He's like, where did you get it? It's on the side of the road. And, and, and you know, that joy, is, is it happiness? I heard about a lady that lost her diamond ring and it went down the sink you know most time it gets caught in the trap i mean i've worked construction all my life and you know you pull those things out and well anyway there's stuff in there um and you know usually it stops down in there but this lady it went out and it went out it went out it, it was so um she calls the city and says, you know, by chance, if somebody's there, I have this ring, and I'd really love, you know, if I could get this ring back. And they're like, well, geez, I, I mean, how are you going to, how can you do that? How could you expect to find something like that? And uh, it just so happens that they had to tear up that area of the, the sewer system, and uh, they're working around in there, and they actually found her diamond ring. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. I'm sure she washed it. But uh, <laughs> but the joy of finding that, just that whole, that whole emotion, and Jesus is playing on that emotion. And honestly, he's playing on that emotion when he's talking about the ten coins. The coins were actually what we would call a dowry. It would be like losing your wedding ring. So for her, it was more than just, oh, I've lost some coins. These were special coins. They really were something she really wanted. They had an emotional value to her. And she's out there sweeping and looking. And and when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is no more. There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. See, again, this is, this is about the whole concept of people coming back to God, the whole idea of a sinner repenting of something that is lost and is now found. That emotion is great. Just losing your wallet and finding it is happy occasion. Can you imagine what it feels like in heaven when God sees and the angels see uh, somebody that turns to him and repents? And there's Make the angels dance. It's an amazing thing. So here we come to this parable, and there is some serious emotion. Because you know what? Family, this is family. And family is hard, isn't it? Family can be really tough. Uh, I mean, we hear of people, guys that we work with, that have not talked to family in years. You know, and, and I, I bet you if we talked about our families right now, there would be some issues in families. So there's a lot of emotion in this passage, and Jesus is really playing on that emotion, and he's talking about that emotion. But really, we get so focused on the prodigal coming back that we miss the point of really what it's all about. And we'll talk about that here at the end. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. 
and he divided his property between them. So here we go. What he's saying to his dad is this. I don't, I don't want to hang around till you die. I, I want my money now. It, it's like spitting in his face. And that, in, in this world, I mean, can you imagine, in our world, Go to one of your parents and say, you know, I got, I know you're going to give me an inheritance. So, you know, I'm, I'm just not waiting around till you die. I want to get out of here. And so give me what is due me. I mean, can you see the arrogance and pride and just the, the kind of the narcissistic tendency of this man? You know, I don't really care about anybody else. I just want mine. I want it now. And the father divides it up. Divides the property up to him. And uh, not many days later, verse 13, the young son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in this country, in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So he's really struck a really rough time. He's lost all his money, I'm sure. You know how it is. A person that's partying, everybody wants to be on the party. He's got the money, he's got everything he wants, and, and he's throwing it around, and everybody's hanging out saying, wow, this, this guy is awesome. We love this guy. And, and, and then all of a sudden, all that money is gone, and those people are like, Let's go look for somebody else that has money, and they're off, because they weren't really his friends. They just wanted his money. And so they all leave, and he's out there. He's got no money. And then all of a sudden, there's a famine. And I have a whole talk on the cycle of poverty, uh, really using um, compassion. I think it's compassion internationals. They have a wheel of poverty. But what they're talking about is one of the couple Oaks of the wheel being gone in poverty, severe poverty, is a devastating thing. And he comes into severe poverty because the economy's gone he, and the, the agriculture is gone. He no longer has a way to make money. There's a famine in the land and he's really struggling. Everything is going wrong. Um, and so he goes out and he feeds pigs. Here's this little Jewish boy feeding pigs. Not, not a good scenario for him, but he's, he's a mess. Verse 17. And when he came to himself, I think that's a great, a great little phrase. And when he came to himself, have we had that moment? Have you had that moment in your life? Where you said, man, I, I, I've, I've tried to do it my way. I've tried everything I could do. I, we work with people day in, day out that have tried everything to fill the whole, whole, to, to, to forget about life, to forget about their mistakes, to forget about guilt, to forget about the family that they've left or messed up. And that's why holidays are so hard for many of these guys. One of the guys we took in, uh, just recently, um, in cottage number nine, um, he spent all day Christmas basically crying. He missed his dad. He missed his mom. This guy's, this guy's a Vietnam vet. He's, he's over 60 years old. And he missed those people. He missed, he does not have anybody. And, and life is messed up. It's for so many of us, maybe we all look good. Y'all look good, by the way. You're looking good. But I know. I know that you look good. But on the inside, so often, there's a mess. Now, these guys that we deal with, they just said, forget the outside. I'm just going to drown it in alcohol or drugs or whatever. And then there's a moment in time. And then he came to himself. We're praying for that moment for many of the guys we work with. That they get to the point, to get to the bottom, that they, that they get to the place where they just cry out, I cannot do it anymore. 
My life is screwed up. I've messed it up. I, I can't do it. We're praying for those days. Maybe, maybe you should be praying for those days in your family. It happened here. This man, he comes to the end of it. He comes to the very, the very bottom. He's a mess. He smells. He's got no clothes. He's got no, he's got no anything to eat. He's got nothing. And he says to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and, and before you. And boy, he sure had. He'd just spit in his dad's face. Give me my money. Let me go. I, want, I don't want anything to do with you or what you have. I'm out of here. Give me my money. And he leaves. Do you think, in his mind, he's thinking, boy, oh boy. If anybody deserved to not like his son, this guy did. He says, well, I'm going to go back there. I'm going to say, I, I, you know, make, make me your servant. Just, just, you know, and he wrote, he said, just treat me like a hired hand. Verse 20 says, and he rose and he comes to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he felt compassion and he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your sons. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The dad's way, I mean, he sees him. A long way off, and he runs to him with his open arms. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the emotion the kid feels? The son, this guy that has spit in his dad's face, that's just fueled him, and gone out and spent all his money. He's at the bottom of his life, and the father doesn't even talk about it. He goes straight to him. He puts his arms around him. He probably stunk. He smelled like a pig. Could be working with pig. You imagine he just put his arms around him and he loved him. It's a picture of God embracing those that are found. This is the picture of the heavenly father that opens his arms and says, come on, I I love you. I don't care what you smell like. I don't care what you've done in your life. I don't care what's happened. I love you. And he embraces him, brings him in. Boy, I tell you, that's such an amazing picture. I I picture, I, I remember back in the day, my wife and I were in Florida. No, we're in Long Island. And this, this man, we were at the, at the diner and, uh, we're sitting at this diner and Danielle was just a little, a little girl. And, uh, here we are in this, we're all nicely clean and everything's nice. The diner's nice. Everything's nice. And sitting at the diner is this man that you could just tell had, had gone through it. He's probably homeless, a stringy, nasty hair. And, and he turned around and looked at, looked at us because we we're probably making too much noise, but, um, and he's got this, just this green, nasty snot hanging out his nose, running across his beard. It's just, I, I see the, I see the, I see the waitress kind of pouring him coffee, kind of like this. One of those, you know. I remember looking at him and him looking at me and just, I, I looked at him and it, I don't know why God gave me a moment. And I thought, you know what? I know God loves that guy and I know that Jesus would, Go up to him, put his arms around him and, and clean him up and help him out. But man, I can't do it. Just, I, I, I can't, I don't even know if I could do it today. And I've worked with a lot of those guys now. And I, I, I it was a moment for me. And I, I knew that it, I knew that God loved him, but I didn't. I've had those guys in my office and I've, I've, I've treated them badly sometimes. My mind goes to the passages, as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. But Jesus is sitting there, and, and I kind of think, no, Jesus wouldn't smell like that. Jesus wouldn't have snot hanging out his nose. He wouldn't smell like cigarettes or alcohol. The Bible doesn't qualify it. He just says, as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, You've done it. So here we are. There's this embrace. The father just completely 
It's like it's not even there. I don't remember that. I'm sure he remembered it, but it's bring bring you in and let's celebrate. This is my son was lost and now is found. We often kind of stop at that point because that's an amazing story. I mean, just it's amazing what God does, opens his arms, brings us in, and we smell like the world, we smell like the nastiness and sin, and he looks straight into your soul, and he knows what's there, and, he's, and he still loves you. He, he looks into my heart, and he looks into my, my life, and he still loves me, and it's not pretty, it's not nice, and he still loves me. So we, we, we love that idea. But really, the focus of the story, remember, who are the people he's telling the story to? They're the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious people. So then we have the story is kind of concluded for them. Verse 25, now the older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered, look, his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command that you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, It's not even my brother, it's this son of yours, came, uh, who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Isn't it interesting that we really feel like there's no conclusion here? Right? So, what did the brother do? I mean, did he say, oh yeah, you're right. Thanks, Dad, for straightening that out for me. I had my attitude a little wrong, so now I'm going to go in and, and hug my brother who's squandered all our wealth. And, and Yeah, so I'm good now. Thanks. We'd like to have that conclusion. I, I believe the reason that Jesus leaves it kind of open-ended like that is He was speaking, again, to the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious people, and it was up to them to decide what they were going to do with it. And so the story is, what did they do? And I guess the story would then be, what will you do? For us, what will I do? Because I felt myself as both of these sons before. When I look at a man sitting at a counter and I ridicule him, I don't want to have anything to do with him. I'm a religious person. And I'm rejecting him because of what he has done, the things he has done. When I drive by a person flying a sign and I don't help them out, and in my mind I think, well, you know, they're, they're there because of choices they've made. They, they should have made better choices. And so I'm, I'm okay. I don't need to give them anything and continue down the road in my, my car and, and my warm, go to my warm house. So I make those choices. We make those choices. And so the question for you is what, which one of these are you? Are you the religious person, the older son, or are you the, the repentant son that comes back to Jesus? Both are pretty difficult. I would say that most of our churches are filled with uh, the religious people. We struggle with those things. I struggle day in, and people call say, you know, well, you know, you have to be called to that kind of a ministry. And I say, that's a lie straight from hell. When I accepted Christ as my Savior, all through the Scripture, it talks about me taking care of the poor. And I qualify it. I wanna, I want them to, you know, well, you, you've, you've, I, you need to feel the pain of your choices. I mean, what gave me, what, what did I ever do to deserve a mom and a dad that loved each other? A mom and a dad that loved each other and loved God. A mom and a dad that loved and respected me. They weren't perfect, but they loved and respected. What did I do to deserve that? I did nothing to be born into the family I was born into. 
I did nothing to get, to have a mind that works right, that can make good decisions about things. I didn't, I didn't deserve that. If you're here and you have the ability to make those choices and you've made those choices, and then you look at somebody else that hasn't, and you ridicule them for the choices they've made and you do not try to help them with it, then you're the person. This is a hard thing. It's tough. I, we look at the people that I work with, we work with all the time. And I, and I want to say, but you gotta feel the consequences for your choices. And there are, it's a hard balance between what, what is best and, and right. And anyway, I'm getting into Sunday school. I don't want to do that. So <laughs> the choice here for you and for us is number one, if, if you're the son running away, you know, God will put you down to the point where you have to come to yourself. And the great thing about that is it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. He's standing there waiting with open arms saying, you know, you are my child. I love you. Come to me. I'm not going to, you smell like the world. You smell like sin. You smell like everything. Come to me. I'll dress you in fine linen, the Bible says. I'll put a ring on your finger. I'll put shoes on your feet. I will make you whole. Come to me. So if you're in that, you, you need to come or, or you're, you're just going to be dropped to the bottom because that's where everybody needs to come. Everybody needs to come to that point where they say, I, I can't do this anymore. My, my life is messed up. I can't do it anymore. And if you're the religious person that says, well, you know, I, I've got it all together, you need to repent of your sin. And come to Christ. I really truly believe that most of our churches are filled with people that really have no idea what it truly means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. They have no idea. We need to find that out and come to him in a real way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful. We're so, I look at this story and I'm so thankful that that you are standing there with your arms wide open, willing to accept me with all the stuff in my life. Lord, I, I dress up nice, I look good, but you know, you know what we are, and you love us. Forgive us, Lord, for not coming to you sooner. Lord, we, we pray for those of us here that are really struggling with the whole religiousness thing. And uh, forgive us for that. Lord, penetrate our heart and our mind. Help us to walk with you in a new way. We pray this in your name. Amen.